it I'll, over to you, Tina. Thank you. Um, well, comrades, we've um, put this section on because um, this is about Emma Watson. Um, it's not been in the papers today, but it's been uh, quite an important issue. I'm going to put their, her tweet on the screen now. <clears throat> People might have seen this. Um, it's a rather tame tweet or Instagram post she put up, actually, I think. But we're not, we're not living in particularly tame times at the moment. So uh, Israel's current ambassador to the UN, Gillard Erdan, fumed that she should have condemned Hamas and the Palestinian Authority instead of putting something like that out. I, you know, Israel is the, the real victim here, but that was nothing compared to, to Danny Danan, the former Israeli ambassador to the United States, who said uh, 10 points from Gryffindor for being an anti-Semite. So basically Emma Watson is an anti-Semite for posting this particular Instagram post, and this was reflected, of course, was repeated in all the newspapers because it's it fits the narrative, the current narrative pretty well. So I've put some of the most um, common definitions of anti-Semitism on the picture as well, so our comrades can see for themselves if they <laughs> believe there's anti anything anti-Semitic anti about this. Um, we've uh, invited a, a few people to discuss this issue and the issues around it. And I'm very pleased to have Garda Kami with us uh, for, for a start, who is a Palestinian academic. I'm struggling to see how this is anti-Semitic. Can you, what, what's your view on this? And can you perhaps explain why this has been um, phrased as anti-Semitic? Look, this is um, only the latest example in a long campaign, which has been waged by the state of Israel and its friends everywhere, uh, to equate, to do two things. First of all, to make any criticism of Israel, which is a state, but nevertheless, any criticism of Israel or the state ideology of Israel, which is Zionism, to equate those with hatred of Jews, which is anti-Semitism, really. So um, this campaign has been very active and has succeeded quite largely um, on this side of the world um, and leading to some really extremely serious consequences, not least of them, the destruction, the political destruction of Jeremy Corbyn, um, who, who's, uh, I think everybody knows very well what happened there. Um, now, the weapon of anti-Semitism, accusing people of being anti-Semitic, has proved extremely valuable for Israel and its friends. Uh, so if anybody does something or says something which uh, criticizes Israel or its, um, or its ideology, then they are automatically um, anti-Semitic, that they are Jew haters. However, what's happened most recently, and it's illustrated by the Emma Watson example, is a further uh, um, step in this uh, campaign which is to equate support for Palestinians with anti-Semitism. Now, this is really uh, something very important for the Israelis. If they can get away with it, if they can um, arrive at a, a, stage, a stage where everybody is nervous to speak about Palestinians, now nobody's talking about Israel here, speaking about Palestinians, um, ha expresses solidarity with Palestinians, um, uh, then that it, it has become anti-Semitic. That would be a huge success for Israel. Um, Emma Watson, you'll notice the tweet meant, does not mention Israel. This, it's about Palestinians. It's about solidarity with Palestinians. Um, that's what it's about. Uh, but it, but it, she's being labeled anti-Semitic. Now, um, Two things really to be said about that. First of all, of course, it's nonsense, and we must see through it for what it is. The weaponization of anti semitism very useful tool um, in the hands of anybody who wants to discredit anybody else can accuse them of being anti-Semitic. It's meaningless. The word anti-Semitism has become meaningless. Anyway, so so that's that's one thing. But you know, the other thing to say about the Emma Watson attack is that. Uh, I, had I been Israel uh, and one of the friends of Israel, I would have really hesitated before attacking her. Because remember, this woman has 
64 million followers on Instagram. She has been voted one of the 100 most influential people on the Times list of uh, one of the 100 uh, you know, most influential. This is a young woman, lots of young people identify with her. They, might not, they don't understand what this business of Israel is and so on, but what they do understand is this uh, wonderful person is being attacked uh, by Israel. So were I Israel's friend, I would have advised them not to go down that route. They've overreached a little bit perhaps with that one, have they? Yes, yes. But you know, I, I, I really, but back to the main issue, you know, we've all got to be terribly, terribly aware of the danger of that kind of campaign that the Israelis are waging, the danger of it succeeding. Because, you know, even unconsciously, uh, if you begin to feel that uh, if you uh, give a platform to Palestinians, support them in any way, invite them to speak, mm -hmm. there's something that makes you uncomfortable. Uh, and you see what I mean? So, so if you do that, even when you're friends, it's extremely serious. Uh, we must not let Israel and its friends succeed. Absolutely not. Absolutely. Thank you, Garda. I think this is all about um, silencing, isn't it? Silencing critics of Israel and making sure Israel is allowed to do whatever it wants, whenever it wants, against the Palestinians and beyond. Um, very successful this campaign has been also in the Labour Party. Thank you for joining us, Gada. We want to speak now to uh, Diana Neslin, who is um, currently involved in suing the Labour Party for repeated uh, harassment on account of her anti-Zionist beliefs. And you were supposed to appear this morning in a BBC4 radio show on that particular question, should anti-Zionism uh, anti be a protected belief? And then you were disinvited because there's been a bit of uh, controversy as always on these issues. Um, uh, the, the board of, of, of Jewish um, deputies, President Marie van der Zyl, I'm gonna qu quickly read out her quote that's been put out and that's that, that added the pressure. She said, uh, it's, uh, inviting you and having this debate even is a grotesque insult to the overwhelming majority of British Jews. Those on the fringes of our community, that's, that's you, uh, have every right to express their views, but uh, you know, for our national broadcaster, blah, blah, blah. So yes, free speech, but not for you. Right? It's only for, for people who agree with, with Marie van der Zyl. Yes, um, uh, the BBC, did, after a long period of negotiation, agree to this program, and everything was going ahead. It was going ahead very smoothly. And then suddenly, on Friday night, Friday afternoon, the Jewish News came out with this, uh, with this report that the Board of Deputies, what the Board of Deputies had said about the uh, program. And... Um, I think the program makers themselves were quite stunned at this. And um, in the end, in spite of negotiation, they were not able to put the program on. What we do, uh, and what we've been talking about is silencing. The program and the Board of Deputies seem to be wanting to silence an alternative view. You note that they say the vast majority of Jews. Now, this is because the vast majority of Jews seem to are, are socialized to believe that Zionism is an integral part of Judaism. And Zionism isn't. In fact, the majority of Zionists are Christian Zionists who are not Jews. So when we talk about anti-Zionism is the same as anti-Semitism, you're implicitly saying, oh, that's because it's about Jews, but it's not. It's about people who believe in a specific ideology. And maybe since today we're talking a lot about history, people should understand that there is another Jewish history. In 1897, at the time, when Zionism became current, when it was established, another organization was established. It was a socialist Jewish organization called the Bund. And that was an organization that spoke to most Jews at the time, including British Jews, 
who felt that their place was in the countries they live, where we live, there we fight. And it was, um, and the Bund actually believed that Jewish people should work in their own communities. I'd like to talk, I'd like, there's a, a lovely quote, I got it from David Rosenberg, from a Polish Bundist, Emmanuel Shrevel. It says, rights and justice for Jews everywhere without wrongs and injustice to other people anywhere. That is the opposite of what Zionism has become, has come to be, because now it's it's known as an organ as a as a an ideology of privileging Jews in the state of Israel. And and for many of us, this is not an ideology that we support. And we need to disinter the alternative history of Jewish people, one that isn't known very much and isn't taught very much to young Jews. But above all, we need to open the debate. We need to talk about it. Uh, you, don't, you, don't dis, you don't actually, uh, if you are so insecure that you aren't prepared to debate, then you don't feel strong, then you don't feel that your ideas and your ideology have much purchase. And that seems to me what is happening today uh, with those organizations that choose to silence us. Absolutely. I think it's also very questionable that the BOD really does uh, represent the vast majority of, of Jews and Jewish opinion, for sure. It's not an hegemonic. I, I think I want to say one more thing. The Jewish Board of Deputies is a representative organization. The people who it isn't, people aren't elected to it. Different organizations join it. And it's conditional, and it's conditional on belief in the Zionist uh, ideology. They don't take people who would challenge a Zionism. Um, so in when they say it's democracy, it isn't, but they have managed to establish themselves very effectively as, uh, as the go-to organization by the mainstream media. And this is what really happens. Uh, they are the go-to organization and, and other organizations don't get a look in if you're not associated with them. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Nayana. There's a lot of talk about, um, you know, the woke culture and people being silenced and, you know, they're not talking about people like you, though, are they? <laughs> in reality, uh, it's, it's interesting. Not uh, can we talk about Maureen Lipman for a minute? She didn't say anything about cancel culture when people like us are not allowed a voice because that doesn't count. In fact, the right are quite happy to deny us a voice. Diana, you're breaking up a little bit. And God, I wanted to say something briefly. Yeah, look, I just want to bring this back to the Palestinians because, uh, you know, one of the things that has been happening is that the Palestinian voice uh, has been silenced by friend and foe alike. I, I really want to make this point because very often you'll find that people are speaking on behalf of Palestinians uh, or they, they slip off, you know, and then the argument gets moved elsewhere. I just, uh, and I'm grateful to this program, honestly, for giving me this opportunity, but I just wanted to make the point, which I think you, thought you all of you probably know, why is Israel so hysterically determined to shut up the, the Palestinian voice? Why? Well, because the Palestinians are the very people who know exactly how Israel was set up, who know exactly the trickery, the, the, the guile, the cheating, the murder with which accompanied the creation of the state of Israel. They cannot afford to have those sorts of narratives out in, into, into public debate because it destroys the myth that Israel is a quote, normal state and that it deserves to be a member of the civilized, uh, the community of civilized nations. It does not, 
it is not a normal state. That's really the message uh, that we need to take away from all this. And only the Palestinians can give the lie to Israel's uh, trickery uh, and <laughs> all these attempts at uh, calling people and just using every trick they can to shut people up about the reality of Israel. Absolutely. Um, I want to uh, welcome now also Huda Amori from Palestine Action, who is very active in exactly oppose, uh, exposing this, that Israel is not a normal state and that we need to, you know, uh, Emma Watson's post said, you know, solidarity is a verb, which it's yeah. not, but you know, what she means is obviously that we have to do something about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on. And, um, and yeah, I don't think I have to say too much about anti-Semitism being used as a tactic to often silence supporters of uh, Palestine and Palestinians themselves. Um, and that's why it's often used because I think that's been covered. But what I will say is that obviously the truth is on our side and that's why supporters of Israel have to resort to using uh, tactics such as this. And what Emma Watson said was that solidarity is a verb and that's the key thing here. I would say that posting isn't necessarily solidarity in itself. And for us normal people who don't have a 60 plus million followers on Instagram, it's important that not only do we stop these attempts to silence us, uh, because these have been going on for a very long time, but actually to refuse to be silenced isn't, isn't enough anymore. It's not, um, we've been speaking up and we've been uh, lobbying and protesting and campaigning for the rights of the Palestinian people for decades now. And we are in the same place um, as, as ever. Uh, the Israeli apartheid regime continues to be entrenched and Palestinians continue to be oppressed. And every single day that this goes on, it is more urgent than ever that we act. Uh, my own family, and I'm sure Rada will agree that this is a common story. All Palestinians have a story that roots back to the occupation. Uh, my great grandfather was shot and killed by a British soldier in the 1920s. Uh, leaving my great grandmother a single uh, pregnant um, mother at the time. And the fact that she was pregnant is actually the only reason that I and uh, most of my family exist uh, today. And that was just after the Balfour Declaration, which was issued by the British government, uh, which basically calls for the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. And my own uh, father and, and my aunties and uncles, when they were young children, were in the front room of their home, hiding under the table uh, because the Israeli military was shooting into their home, trying to kill them simply because they were Palestinian. And the only way they managed to escape was to crawl through the back of their house with just the clothes they had on their backs and no shoes on, and they had to run um, and hide in caves. Eventually they made their way over to Iraq and eventually they came here. But, um, but this is a system, the system of ethnic cleansing and control over the Palestinians is happening today. We're seeing Palestinians in East Jerusalem um, being forced out of their homes yet again. This is a constant story for Palestinians. We see Palestinians in Gaza stuck in what even David Cameron has called the world's largest open air prison who are constantly under the bombardment of Israeli bombs and warplanes and drones, drones which are in fact built here in Britain on our doorsteps. And actually often the Israel uses the fact that they've kept the Palestinians captive in Gaza um, in order to test, market their weapons as tested, tested on the Palestinian people. And this is the true face of Israel's apartheid regime. And these factories building these components for weapons which are going to be used to not only kill Palestinians, but to kill people across the world are built in front of us. So I would say that solidarity is, is more than just speaking up. When we have these weapons being built in front of us, then solidarity means that we have to push ourselves and make ourselves slightly uncomfortable, where we do live in all in all in a comfortable life compared to those uh, living in Palestine. And sometimes that means putting our liberty on the line to do the right thing and to shut these places down. Uh, it, it's gone on long enough um, and I'm, 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 I'm so tired of, of hearing the same accusations of anti-Semitism being thrown because they will always do it. It's the same tactic. They do it because we have the truth and, and, and on our side, but we won't win unless the grassroots rises up 
um, in countries such as Britain and takes on these factories and takes on um, Israel's apartheid regime where it manifests. And, you know, we have th these factories are in Oldham, they're in Leicester, they're in Bristol, uh, where we saw the Colston Ford tearing down the statues. And just as the people of Bristol tore down the statues of the slave traders, we have to tear down Israel's arms factories um, and apply those same principles to the people um, of Palestine. So I would urge people to join us in Palestine action, to support us however you can, and to continue to not only speak up, but to act for the Palestinian people. Thank you very much, Corin. Thank you. That was absolutely right. And if you have not been to Palestine Action's website, please go and check it out. There's loads of information about Elbit and JCB and uh, the crimes they're, they're helping to uh, commit in, in, in Israel. So unfortunately, we have to leave it at, at this, I'm afraid. We have got still loads more on in this show. So I'm bringing back uh, Chris Bin. Thank you for, for coming, Corinne. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for a great discussion there. And um, and, and, and great to see Huda and um, Huda and, and Dinah. <laughs>